Welcome back to Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik, where we bring you news, politics, and culture without the red and blue treatment. I'm Bob Schleyhuber here with Michelle Witte. Time for our weekly sports segment, Foul Play, bringing you the best and sadly the worst of sports around the world. I like the worst. The worst. This week, we're joined by our good friend, Michael Sampson, who is part of the national leadership of the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression and co-host of Red Spin Sports. Michael, welcome to Fall Play. Hey, how you doing? How's everybody doing today? Do I, we're doing all right. Yeah, <laughs> we're doing all right. We're, all right. we're doing all right. We're just outside of the militar, militarized green zone, I guess some people had called it here, in Washington, I think we should DC. be calling it. The blue zone. The blue zone. Yeah. Get it? Because the Democrats are back in power. Brand new, <laughs> brand new day in America. Michael, you know, you have Joe Biden at the White House, which will allow for apolitical sports players to feel better about coming to the White House after winning championships again. And we have news that WNBA team, the Atlanta Dream, are close to being sold which would leave now former U.S. Senator Kelly Loeffler unassociated with the team. So, hey, that seems all right, right? I mean, you know, (laughs) you know, like I think what we saw was the last four years of kind of a a mass formation of uniting against Trump. And um, I think, you know, you had some sports teams that didn't want to show up to D.C. in protest of Trump, you know, and. I guess now that Biden's elected, they're going to feel more comfortable doing that, I guess. So, I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> do you think athletes, I mean, do will they come back? Oh, finally, a Democrat, Joe Biden, everything's normal again in America. Sports athletes will return to the White House. Or do you think there is an increased consciousness amongst athletes that they say, wait a second, regardless of political party, neither of these parties in Washington, D.C., especially when it comes to policing. I mean, Joe Biden's going to trip over his own feet within give him, I don't know, when's his first speech? Is it later on today? His second speech after the speech he gave after being sworn in, let him talk after there's a national shooting. And I think a lot of these athletes, especially the NBA and the WNBA are going to say, yeah, no, we're going to make a lot of noise regardless who the president is. Or sadly, do you think they're going to go back to, oh, Democrats, liberalism here again, we can return regardless of what's taking place? I think it'll be the former initially. I mean, I think it's going to be, you know, now that a Democrat's back in office, you'll see more athletes coming back. I mean, I think you may see kind of some sporadic kind of, you know, right-wing activism among the players, you know, who uh, who, who may not show up, you know, here or there, you know, isolated or so. But overall, I think there's going to be kind of, kind of uh, normalization, at least when it comes to sports, you know, going to the White House. Um, at least initially, but I think that's what kind of the grassroots movement is going to have to play into it, you know, to really make sure that, you know, that the agenda for, you know, you know, fighting against police crimes is is out there and it puts pressure on, on you know, President Biden or, and Congress. And hopefully out of that, you know, we'll see another spark. Like, I don't think, you know, I don't think there's going to be a reversal on um, on athletes using that platform to you know, put forth like their views on racism and whatnot. I think that's irreversible. I'm curious, Michael, big question here, since you tried to pass me the Kool-Aid last night, when the Jacksonville Jaguars win the Super Bowl in 2023, how are you going to feel about them visiting the White House? Are you going to join Joe Biden and Urban Myers up on the platform? Lifting the trophy? I doubt I I doubt <laughs> I will. <laughs> but I know I'll be personally excited, uh, you know, as a, as a Jaguar fan, I guess, from Jacksonville, you know, I'm, you know, Jacksonville's constantly, you know, pooted on by the rest of the nation. So uh, maybe that's a sense of, you know, maybe that's, you know, that's what sports does for a, a lot of folks in different cities. You know, it gives them a sense of some type of pride they may have. Um, so I, I definitely will be happy with that. <laughs> I, I highly doubt I'll be visiting D.C., you know, as a part of a parade of sorts. They're not going to invite you. Don't worry. Don't worry. They definitely won't. No. <laughs> I'm the last person they'll invite On the topic, Michael, of uh, sports and protest, I don't know that we are going to have athletes coming back and feeling, uh, you know, as as Bob suggested, uh, comfortable now that there is a a Democrat in the White House. I think there is going to be pressure, more pressure to give them time. You know, if there is one thing that I think the Democrats do well, it is playing up this idea that they are the adults in the room. 
and that you might have these childish desires to see murderous police officers punished or to, you know, make enough money to be able to pay your rent. But, you know, they're the ones who really know how the world works and they know how things get done. And it just happens that it takes 55 years or something to get a $15 minimum wage and anything you want beyond that, beyond, you know, what they decide are the sort of perimeters of, of your own ambition uh, is foolish. Right. And so best let them just just get along to handling things. And so I don't even know that you're going to have I, I think there will be, you know, we saw we saw Obama come out and try and, you know, talk, Obama comes out and talks to LeBron James and talks to these NBA players who were talking about a, a boycott or a strike. And then the next thing we know, you know, all that energy sort of dissipates into uh, getting out the vote. And so I don't know that it's going to be as much uh, acquiescence and complacency as it is going to be pressure Pressure to keep quiet, pressure to keep going, pressure to, you know, let the grownups do do their job. And I think that'll be unfortunate. But that that would be my prediction. Well, I, what I will say is on the situation with the NBA strike, you know, that was really pretty much led by the Milwaukee Bucks, who had a kind of a who are the first team to really not play that day. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, um, the Jacob Blake was shot literally mm-hmm. like an hour from where they practiced. So they were the ones that started it and it got the other team to do a one day kind of strike of sorts. Now. You know, I highly doubt it. The momentum was there for the all the NBA players to go on strike to demand justice for Jacob Blake in the same way that like regular working class unions, like you know, aren't really striking for Black Lives. And I mean, I think I think that consciousness just isn't there yet. I think that that incident, what it did, was it started a spark. You know, and of course, you know, Obama is the master. You know. Um, fluffer, you know, he's the guy that <laughs> that comes, you know, that that you know, uh, demilitarizes, if that's a word, um, he fangs, yeah, you know, and, and that's what he does. But I think, you know, what you can't subtract is the um, experience of people understanding that, you know, uh, rebellions get the good, you know, and mm-hmm. I yeah. think, like, I think another way to look at it, you know, like I can definitely see what you what you're saying in regards to, you know, a return to normal so-called normalization of, you know, black people getting murdered and Democrats, you know, just lying and not doing anything about it. What I will say is I think one thing that we do know is that the cops will continue to kill people. Um, White supremacists, you know, vigilantism and killings will continue to exist. So if anything, I think the movement feels that, you know, we elected whoever is in office. You know, it, it didn't matter who was in that seat. It didn't matter if it was Biden, if it was Bernie or whomever, you know, they wanted Trump out because he represented, you know, you know, un, unrestrained, you know, cop violence, you know, not that the Democrats hadn't done that themselves or allowed it. But, you know, he was a yeah. he was a, a supporter of it. So I think that, you know, energy, like you said, was translated into the vote. But I do think there's a lot more pressure um, on the, on the Democrats. To actually do something because, yeah. like I said, the cops are going to kill somebody and then they're going to be looking at Biden in the White House and what are you going to do about it? Yeah, and people aren't dumb to it. I mean, people know his history with the, the crime bill. They've heard him say the last year here, we it's not less money, it's more money for training and reforms and just shoot him in the leg. So I think people are well aware that he by no means was the choice. It was the choice not to have Donald Trump return to office that led to Joe Biden. People were not saying, yes, this guy Joe Biden is here for us and we're not going to continue to protest because we think we're on this path to progress. Mike, let's talk about some other sports news out there. We'll stick with the NBA. You know, you sent me a story last night and just, again, it's just like tragic laughter here. NBA commissioner. Adam Silver is discussing the possibility of having some of their players receive the COVID-19 vaccine to educate and influence the the public. Silver says there has been an enormous resistance, especially in the African-American community. Adam Silver, a skinny, bald, white guy. Adam Silver says there's been enormous resistance, especially in the African-American community, something he sees must change for the pandemic to end. Public health experts, including Dr. Anthony Fauci, have said that leaders with large platforms such as athletes can set an example by getting the vaccine. I mean, Michael, two things here. Pretty funny and cynical attempt at these rich folks to jump the line under this absurd PR stunt. And I'm pointing the finger at Adam Silver and the owners, not the players. And second, again, not a critique of the athlete, but this is a critique of of society and culture that the validators, those who would validate this idea that they should take the vaccine, people should take a vaccine are sports athletes and not uh, people of, I don't know, like doctors or educators or any, any other range of profession. But again, it's the athlete is the only 
leader icon within the black community. And, and that obviously has been narrowed for certain reasons by the white culture of this country. Well, I think there's a lot of play with Adam Silver said. I think there's a lot of it kind of, you know, definitely white supremacist logic that kind of says that only, yeah, it's African-Americans. They're the ones that have a problem believing in vaccines when, yeah. you know, you literally had a capital insurrection of thousands of, you know, most white right. people who don't believe in vaccines and wasn't wearing masks. I think that's kind of overplayed. You know, like, you know, let's say who's the most revered person in the black community, you know, and living is probably Obama. You know, he was the president for eight years, first black president. He took a vaccine. So if 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 let's just say that you believe that African-Americans don't believe in vaccines or, you know, you're saying that we're not taking it because of just because of rightful distrust in the government historically with how, you know, vaccines and experimentation and stuff. Let's just say you buy that. Then if. Obama takes the vaccine and people still aren't believing in taking the vaccine. What makes you think, you know, Oh, LeBron took it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's going to, yeah. You know, but I kind of reject that off face value. I mean, I think uh mass culture and, you know, like it wasn't, you know, it, it hasn't been prominent African-American leaders and people in the hood who've been saying, you know, you know, like you have people in the hood who say COVID is whatever, you know, not a real thing, but, you know, when, when you have the president of the United States saying that and you have governors saying that, you know, there's an institutional problem at play, you know. And so I just, you know, like, first of all, athletes shouldn't get preference over frontline people day to day who mm-hmm. have to put themselves out there, like the workers who every day, health care workers and stuff who put themselves out on the front lines, you know, athletes aren't special. Um, they shouldn't be getting priority. But, you know, I think that whole logic it should, it should just be rejected. You know, yeah. essentially, they want athletes to get their vaccine so they can keep them out there to make money for the billionaires. You know, uh, I mean, that's why. So you don't have to cower and oh, we just want to help spread awareness in the black community. You know, I think that's kind of BS. Yeah. I mean, there was something weird that also happened too. that. Like on the other side of things, the fact that L.A. is under just crisis mode and yet you have the Lakers and Clippers playing each other at the L.A. stadium and at the Staples Center, it blows my mind there because then it tells your anti-maxers or anti-vaxxers that like, wait a second, how are these people able to come together and meet each other when we're told do not leave your home under any circumstances, yet the people who own basketball teams, they get to have their players go out there and play. And even this limited number of having fans in the stadium, people say, well, wait a second, why can they gather in the stadiums or gather out on the streets if they're outside? Isn't that safe? And so it's interesting as sports have restarted at the demand of these wealthy billion billionaire owners it's also sent mixed messages around wait is covid that serious can we gather and it's given people that are anti-vaxxers or anti-maskers just another thing to point to and say but wait why is this happening in our society when i'm being told all of these other things i thought that was also interesting no 100 percent. i mean it shows a clear kind of hypocrisy in which you know like you have people saying everyone needs to you know, like I'm in Florida, so it's been pretty much wild, wild west since mm. the beginning. <laughs> there's mm. been no restrictions. I mean, there's no restaurant, you know, cap restrictions. There's, you know, there's been sporting events, you know, for the past couple of, couple of months, you know. So that's a different experience. But especially in a place like L.A. where you have, you know, they're telling people you can't go out, you know, no outdoor dining and stuff like that. Yet you can still play sports and have those type of gatherings. I mean... It kind of, t- I mean, I think people are like realize there's like a, there's like a hierarchy, you know, and, and what makes money for folks and like the NBA, NFL, those sports leagues makes a lot of money for some very, you know, in the, you know, in the ruling class and some very important people who need to make a lot of money with a lot of TV, like billions of dollars worth of TV contracts they have to fulfill. Yeah. And oftentimes the sport team, the, the owner owning of the sports teams, they're, they're second income, right? Like they're always rich from mm-hmm. oil deals or from communications up, yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. Michael, I wanted to ask you this with a few minutes left here regarding the NFL and concussions. I wanted to talk a little bit about Kansas city quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, who was diagnosed with a concussion on Sunday and is dealing with a foot injury from their game against the Cleveland Browns. The Kansas city team will play the Buffalo bills this upcoming Sunday in the AFC championship game. When an NFL player is concussed, they enter into what is called the NFL's concussion protocol process. The process consists of five steps going from basically, are you alive to basic balance checks to full practice and then clearance to play. You know what I found really interesting this week, and it's, 
I think maybe a watershed moment for the league is that major sports outlets are reporting on the concussion and the protocol process. There is actually in-depth reporting on the impact of the concussion and what happens after a player is concussed. What is alarming, though, is at the same time as these major outlets are calling out the concussion and explaining to us what concussions are, they also seem to be cheering Mahomes on through the process Basically reporting, he's past step one. He's past step two. Will he get to step three? Maybe step four. And rooting on this young man who just suffered a major brain injury, saying that you should go back out less than seven days after you had a concussion and go out and play, which I think is not the best idea. And at at least he should just take off this game, roll the dice, and give himself two, three weeks to take off before the Super Bowl. I don't know, Michael, what did you make of this conversation about the concussions in the media? And are, are we at a new point when it comes to brain injuries and openly talking about it in sports media? I mean, I think definitely compared to 10 years ago, you know, when, when, you know, players, you know, former and current players say that, you know, getting a concussion, they would just keep playing through. I, I know Brett Favre, who's a, a QB for the Packers, Oof. talked about it a couple of days ago, how, how many concussions he actually played on. And back in you know his day, which was not that far away, um, he was talking about how, you know, uh, normally it's something that what Pat Mahomes went through, he would keep playing through it already. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a very, you know, McKee's more aggressive sport that, that highlights, you know, being a man and being tough and going through all that. So I think the concussion protocol stuff is a positive thing. However, I mean, at the bot at the end of it, you still have that, that bottom line of profit and, you know, what's entertainment and, you know, is it more exciting for folks to see Pat Mahomes at QB, you know, in the AFC Championship game or Chad Henning, you know? So, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of pressure on him. You know, like I know they said there's an independent doctor who's going to look at it and, and so forth. I mean, I don't necessarily think when there's billions involved, there's any type of independence yeah. to anybody, you yeah. know? So there's, there's, there's going to be an immense amount of pressure to make sure he's clear for Sunday. But I'm sure, I, I, and, and I think a lot of times, it, the issue also is, um, you know, it's with the institution, like 99% of it, but the athlete himself, you know, not really looking out for their best interests, you know, kind of being programmed into, I have to do this for the team and I have to do this for, yeah. you know, for the fans and stuff. You know, he's going to, he's putting himself under a lot of a pressure, a lot of pressure to play, you know, and I mean, I think that's one of those you know, I think we have to keep being vigilant. I think I think it's a good thing that like media is reporting on a concussion protocol and yeah. making sure that you know and making aware of it because yeah. you know, the NFL because of the NFL is left to their own vices. You know. Yeah, I mean those those stories from Brett Favre talking about his concussions and then talking about it later in his life after he's left the league of going and watching his daughter play sports and not even remembering going to watch her play. I mean the long term brain injuries. Uh, and the damage and the symptoms from these concussions. I mean, it stays with you the rest of your life to be a her- hero in the moment. Michael Sampson, co-host of Red Spin Sports. Thanks for being with us today. Before you get out of here, who do you have in the Super Bowl? Um, I am, uh, you know, I am uh, anti uh, Tom Brady. Okay. Due to his appearance, his training with the IDF. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm going for the Chiefs and uh, the Packers. You know, the Packers are. All right. No one cares about the Packers. That no one is cares. A lie. No one, <laughs> as a former <laughs> Chicago Bears fan. That is now the closest I've come to swearing on the show, Bob. That is a damn lie. Michael Sampson, thanks for hanging out with us this week in our weekly sports segment, File Play, man. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. All right. You're listening to Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik. We're live in D.C. and we're back after this. Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik, where we bring you news, politics, and culture, even on Inauguration Day, even after Bob has maligned okay. the Green Bay Packers. No uh, unbelievable, cares. really. A really tragic end to what had been a pretty good show so far, Bob. <laughs> Uh, it's been somehow. a great day here in America. <laughs> uh, Chris Wallace, best inaugura- inauguration address he's ever heard. Which uh, I don't know. Man. Maybe he's listening to a different one. But we got all the way through the show without even talking about any of Trump's uh, last minute pardons. Ah, can we just uh, real quick before we get to the pardons? I do just have to laugh right now that Joe Biden is currently reviewing troops. And it looks like we got a time machine and brought back troops from the 17, 18, 1900s. 
all dressed up in historical outfits here to review the troops of all time. He has to assess their readiness. Part of a... Part of the thing you do. Yeah. Kind of also creepy that they assess the readiness to move National Guardsmen from around the country here in days. I'm sure they're going to keep the playbook for that. So if they ever have to, for whatever reason, do this again, they'll make it a much smoother process. They're getting a lot of hot meals out there. On a lot the street, of hot Bob. meals. We Thank you, it. Jose Andres, because the people that are sleeping in tents and out on the streets, they don't need those meals. Well, also Spike Mendelson, not only Jose Andres. Oh Lots goodness. of blame to go around. Spike yeah. Mendelson and random Capitol Hill residents going out there to feed the troops thank you any favorite trump pardons michelle as we head out of here i mean bannon just because it reminded everybody that what bannon was actually sunk for was this like really grubby petty fraud scheme to get people to wasn't it getting people to contribute build money to build the wall we'll and then just ourselves. pocketing it i mean yeah that's I, did that's, they ever pay us the mexicans did they ever did we ever uh get that check Mr. Trump, did they ever? Uh, no, uh, no, I don't think so. I'm still waiting. Awkward. I have awkward. to email somebody. Yeah, that was a, that was a good one. Uh, you got a, you got a favorite there, Bob? Lil Wayne, Kodak Black. I guess not Kodak. Kodak Black is a horrible human being. Lil Wayne was funny. He's made like good albums. People like him. It's got some cultural significance. He's done something. Kodak Black is just a creepy young dude who got way too much money and then started riding around with guns for no reason. But is it? great, he's pardoned. Is it me or is there a, a notable number of people sort of involved in and significant to the world of hip hop among Trump's pardons? Well, those two. Yeah, two. but there was also uh, there's also the dude who was like co-founder of Rock Records. Or oh, what yeah. One of Snoop Dogg's buddies. Yeah, like there was a couple. Uh, Desiree Perez. Wasn't Desiree Perez also? Uh, <laughs> 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 Kwame so. Kilpatrick, the former mayor of Detroit, was pardoned. We also have Shalom Weiss, Anthony Lewandowski, a former Google engineer who pleaded guilty to stealing secret technology related to self-driving cars from the company before becoming the head of Uber's rival unit. Mm. Take that, Uber. Yeah. Trishon Blackman's going to love that. Yeah. Anything that slows down the self-driving car phenomenon. All right. Yeah. Uh, we also had, uh, I'll, I was torturing you about this privately, but we can probably re- repeat it publicly. This is the first of many. We had uh, economist Paul Krugman tweeting that today is the first day of the rest of America's life, which I mean, I guess you could say every day, but that's crazy. yeah, it's going to be people, people warming these up for the next several hours. Bob. Can't wait. I'm just going to go home. I'm going to take a quick nap and then I can't wait to turn on me some Tom Hanks. Oh, you want to hear something else? Tom really, Hanks. Really gross, Bob. Sure. Yeah, we've got a Washington Post story today about this uh, healthcare CEO who owned a, a chain of nursing homes. Uh, he just left with a 5.2 million retention bonus uh, while he owned that chain. 2,800 residents died of COVID. So, but as long as you keep costs down, and run things efficiently. Who cares if every old person in your home dies of this virus, right? Five million dollars out the door. Thank oh. you very much. Great job. Great oh. job saving us money. So, Speaking of the virus, first U.S. coronavirus case reported one year ago today. Happy anniversary, Thanks. everyone. What a beautiful day. Yeah. Your data shows Americans are dying faster of COVID-19 than U.S. soldiers during World War II. In related news there, the Department of Veterans Affairs says about 400,000 Americans died fighting the Second World War. According to new data from Johns Hopkins University, over 400,000 Americans have already died of COVID-19 in less than a quarter of that time. Yep. And uh, in a final indignity, Bob. For, oh, I want to get a final, final one after. For President Trump. Trump. No, this mine. is going to be the last this one. The, the last rest one? of his life is going to be very dignified. Oh, okay. Uh, SAG-AFTRA. Oh, that was mine. I was going to take that. Go well, for it. All right. Close us out. Uh, they're going to have a heal- hearing to talk about expelling Trump. From their union. This is the Screen Actors Guild, the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. They announced yesterday, uh, right? Yesterday? Tuesday? Tuesday. Yeah. That the board had overwhelmingly voted to move forward with a hearing to investigate a claim that Trump has violated the union's constitution. Uh, That it is, I guess, about instigating this uh, riot in the Capitol a couple weeks ago. It's the union president, Gabrielle Carteris. (laughs) Oh, whoa. She's the president, Gabrielle Carteris of uh, 90210. Uh, she claims Trump is to blame for the protest at the Capitol and, uh, you know, they put put journalists and members of the union covering the event in danger. And so now I guess their group's disciplinary committee can decide to fine, censor or reprimand 
Trump, but Carteris is asking Trump to be expelled. So, man, still the teacher's pet, even after all these years, <laughs> even after leaving Beverly Hills, huh? Hills High School. Huh. Who would have thought this whole time Donald Trump was part of a union? Would have never have wow. guessed it. Yeah, that's funny. The about union it. man, no longer president. Well, welcome <laughs> to the Biden administration. We'll talk more about Joe Biden's presidency tomorrow when we return on Political Misfits. Big thank you to our guests today, David Swanson, Dr. Jack Rasmus, Mora, Mara, Maru, Mora, B.L. Pondo, Sarah Data, and Michael Sampson. Big thank you as always to Ryan, Dimitri, Andre, and Saul, and the entire Sputnik News team for keeping us going during the pandemic. Today's episode was produced by the very talented Ebony Mick Morris. And on behalf of Michelle Witte and myself, Bob Schlehuber, thank you for listening. Now get back to organizing.